Good morning. Welcome to St. John's. This is March 22nd, 2020, and uh, welcome to another installment of our social distancing worship uh, together-ish. Um, I just want to give you a couple of updates. Uh, obviously, the situation has been very fluid and uh, developing as we go. I just um, want to read you really quickly something from Governor Cuomo uh, as of Friday uh, during in the definition of essential businesses. Um, he writes, houses of worship are not ordered closed. However, it is strongly recommended no congregate service services be held and social distance maintained. Um, so, and that's one reason why we're doing what we're doing. So I just want to remind you, um, you know, where, where everything is. And also in my own personal conversation with the health department, uh, we were obviously strongly recommended not to have any gatherings or any groups. We do not want to be the, the cause or the agent for spreading anything. So we are trying to be safe. And uh, while we respect the, the idea that um, Governor Cuomo is not ordering us to be closed, closed, um, we are doing the rest of what he's saying. And um, I'm hoping that you all understand how difficult this is uh, for us to, to make these decisions. And I also wanna remind you, uh, as our conference dean said, um, church is not closed. We may not allow you in right now, but we are not closed. The office is running, the business is running, church is operating, we are contacting people, we are reaching out in any way that we can and trying to stay connected with all of you. So I want you to just remember that um, although the door may be closed for public entry right now, the church itself, St. John's Lutheran Church, is operating every single day and we're continuing all the services that we can provide in any way that we can. So we feel bad if you have not been contacted and if you're feeling separated from us, uh, give us a call, send us an email, let us know so that we know to reach out to you, but we're, we're working very hard to stay connected in the best way we can. Which is also a reminder for you, um, right now, this is a great time for you to uh, stay connected to each other, you know, the old fashioned way with like a pen and paper and a stamp and, and some letters. Uh, write letters, make phone calls, stay connected because right now, more than ever, people are hungry for relationship and for be feeling valued. And for each of you at home, if you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling frustrated, if you're feeling panicked, um, I heard a tip this morning, you know, look in the mirror and tell yourself five things, positive things about you, about your life, about your world. Start your day with positive thoughts and positive comments and, and maybe that will help you keep some perspective in the midst of this very confusing time. And know that we are praying for you every single day. So with that, let's frame our minds and hearts uh, as we prepare to worship God this morning. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who gathers us from the wilderness to redeem us and make us new. Amen. Gathered in the name of Jesus, let us now turn our hearts toward God in humble confession. God of all grace, we confess that we have wandered and have often lost our way. Do not remember the deeds of our past, but help us to turn our faces toward the future where your forgiveness is sure and your love overflows. Amen. God embraces you in tender care and feeds you with surprising mercy. Like a loving parent, God runs to meet you again this day, forgiving your sins for the sake of Jesus Christ and leading you into life anew. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come to us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your Spirit. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
I'm going to read you an extra text this morning. The, the gospel is, is very long again, so I apologize for that, but it's a great gospel. But also this psalm for today, um, however anointed the, the uh, lectionary is, and it is, the psalm for today is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and you guide me along the right pathways for your name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And here's the Holy Gospel according to St. John in the ninth chapter. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, it's got to be somebody like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, The man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought the, to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus had made the mud and opened this man's eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man said, He's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He can speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents had said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I've told you already, but you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? 
Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciple of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do say see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. This is the gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> Praise to you, O Christ. So, have you ever known someone who um, was so convinced of something that there was nothing you could say to them that would ever change their mind? Uh, or someone who is so driven to accomplish a certain thing that nothing could ever stop them? Uh, or someone who is so angry that they could just never let it go? I bet you do know somebody like that. Or maybe you have been somebody like that at some point in your life. Um, but you know the term for that, right? We, we call it blind. Um, blind anger. Blind ambition. Blind love. Where no matter what evidence is presented, um, your opinion doesn't change. That exact kind of blindness has been the downfall for so many people throughout history. And, and today we find it again in the gospel where there's a whole bunch of blind people. First, you have the obviously blind guy whom everybody in the text seems to know. I mean, he's been around for a while and it says all the people knew him as a beggar. Now in this moment, all he does is walk over to the pool of Siloam. Um, and I wonder how far away they can be right then because he washes up and he comes right back. Um, and it's funny because instantly nobody recognizes him. He, he may not have even been completely out of sight over the pool. And only one thing about him has changed. I find that amazing. Only one aspect of him is different. But um, they don't recognize him. They don't admit who he is. And no one can explain it. And everybody's frustrated. So who are the blind people in this text? Um, well, the neighbors in this moment are definitely blind. They're blinded by logic. They're, they're, they're blinded by reason. They're blinded by their own limits of what they believed could be possible, by what they believed could be true. This whole thing was just too radical for them to wrap their heads around. So off they go trying to make logical sense out of a miraculous moment, which is a classic, maybe the classic human mistake. Um, which leads to the next classic human mistake, um, which is thinking, well, if, if we could just find Jesus, he would clear it all up, right? And I say it's a mistake because ultimately you know what happens. I mean, we're getting close to Holy Week, and when they do find Jesus, they don't believe him either. And, well, you know what happens on Thursday and Friday. So... Look, it's, it's easy to be blind to the possibilities of God. It's easy to be blind to the possibilities of Jesus. It's easy to be blind to Jesus himself, just like his own family would be blind to his power that time when he returned home. So really, um, even if the former blind guy could find Jesus and bring him back in today's gospel, what good would that do? 
the people's opinions have been cemented. Now, in what ways um, are we cemented in our faith, in our opinions, in our definitions about what's right and what's wrong, about what's possible and what's impossible, um, about what is acceptable or unacceptable to God. So back to the gospel, here's the people trying to do the right thing. Uh, and so they, they go to the authority on the subject. They go to the pastor, uh, or in this case, they go to the Pharisees for an explanation. And so together, the Pharisees and the crowds, they're trying to make sense of it all. And they're trying to figure out, well, is this guy Jesus from God? I mean, well, it was a miracle, but a miracle on the Sabbath, still a sin. Um, God would never sin, so he must not be from God. But no one except God could do what he did. But wait, God wouldn't sin. And the Pharisees are saying, and we know what sin is because we are experts. Classic human mistake number three. So therefore they conclude Jesus can't be from God. The miracle can't have happened. Therefore, the man is actually still blind or never was. Either way, he's lying and has been lying his whole life. That has to be the answer. You see what happens when, when we decide what is sin and what is not, when we decide what is right and what is wrong, when we decide what is possible or impossible, when we decide what God can or should do or what God can or cannot do. I mean, isn't that why we were supposed to never eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the first place? Isn't this what got Adam and Eve in trouble? And here we are in the gospel having the same exact problem. The Pharisees and the crowds were basically as blind as bats without sonar. Are we? How often do we encounter those who are so blinded by their rules and traditions and expectations and definitions that they are cemented in place? And, and I, I don't know if this is even worse, but maybe it is that even the man's parents are, are blind. Um, they were blinded by their own fear, blinded by their own need for self-preservation, blinded by politics, blinded by threats from their elders, because as you as we read, anyone who even hinted that Jesus might be from God or might be the Messiah would be thrown out of the temple, excommunicated. Were they willing to risk all that for this? Unfortunately, no. See, for so many people, nothing, no matter how grand it may be, is enough for us to take the risk of losing our own sense of security, for us to lose our own sense of what makes sense to us. Unfortunately for humanity, we don't want to lose our concrete reasoning, even if it's our own minds or hearts that are cemented shut. And that's precisely why Jesus says in verse 41 of this gospel, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you've said you can see, and essentially, you are experts. Your sin remains, he says. That's all very, very scary. Um, I tell you what, though, the only person in today's gospel text who was not blind was Jesus. But wait, maybe he was the most blind of all. Jesus was blind to the criticisms of his detractors. Jesus was blind to the threats, the fears, the politics, the traditions, um, the status, the power, blind to the trappings, blind to the self-centeredness. 
He was blind to his own disciples' ignorance. But most of all, perhaps, Jesus was blind to the stigma of accepting an unacceptable person. Jesus is blind to your imperfections. Jesus is blind to our cemented minds and hearts. Blind to the fact that we don't deserve to be in his presence. And it is precisely because Jesus is blind to his own judgment that he can truly see who you are. Thank God Jesus is blind to everything that separates us from him and from each other. Maybe knowing that, this week, we too become, could become just blind enough to truly see our neighbor. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, turning our hearts toward God, who is gracious and merciful, let's take a moment to pray for the church, for the world, especially right now, and for anyone who is in any kind of need. God of insight, open the hearts of the church and the world to all who testify to your deeds of power. Raise up voices in your church that are often silenced or overlooked. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of insight, empower us to care for the land and for all living things that dwell in and beneath it. Provide rich soil for crops to grow. Bring rain to lands suffering drought. Protect hills and shorelines from damage caused by storms and erosion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of insight, bring peace to all people and nations. Anoint leaders who seek goodness, righteousness, and truth on behalf of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of insight, you care for our needs even before we ask. Come quickly to all who seek you this day. Accomplish healing through the work of doctors and nurses, even physical therapists, nutritionists, all who tend to human bodies, all who are working to tend to this virus around your world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of insight, you call out to those who are asleep and awaken them to new life with you. We give you thanks for all your saints. Join us together with them as your children in this world and the next. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all of our prayers as we commend them to you and lift them into your loving hands. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now one final prayer before we go on our ways today. The Lord be with you. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you sent light to conquer all darkness, and you sent bread of heaven to nourish all your people. Send us forth this day with the healing power of your grace and our very life, that we may serve you more fully today by loving our neighbors more deeply. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon each one of you with favor and grant you peace. Amen.
So now, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being with us today. And may you have a safe and healthy day. Six feet apart. God bless you.